Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Hodovic and I am the Brown County Auditor Treasurer. Before we get started, I would like to thank the New Home Public Library and Community Access Television for this opportunity to present an overview on our election process. Our agenda today is going to look at timelines, polling locations, registering to vote, absentee voting and mail ballots, healthcare facilities and agent delivery, and transparency and public access. 2022 election cycle is very unique because not only did we have a special election for a congressional district due to an opening, we also had the census. So in September of 2021, the census released redistricting data. Typically they release it about April, but it was delayed due to the pandemic. On February 1st of 2022, precincts held caucuses. These are meetings run by Minnesota's political parties. They are the first in the series of meetings where parties may endorse candidates, select delegates, and set goals and values, which are often referred to as party platforms. Many activities include choosing volunteers who will organize these political activities in the precinct, discussing ideas for the party to support, and selecting the delegates who will endorse candidates at future conventions. In February, on the 8th, it was the last day to hold municipal and school district special elections because of redistricting. On February 15th, the court released redistrict congressional and legislative districts. Then on March 8th were the township elections. Towns that hold their election in March for township offices include Albin, Bashaw, Eden, Holm, Lake Hanska, Leavenworth, Milford, Prairieville, and Stark Township. When I refer to township offices, it may be a township supervisor, a clerk, or a treasurer, and oftentimes the clerk and treasurer are combined positions. Then in March, at the end of March, was the deadline to reestablish or redistrict precincts and city ward boundaries. This was also the, uh, the deadline to designate polling places. Typically that deadline would be December 31st. As I just previously mentioned, February was the last uniform election date because of redistricting. Typically, there would be an April and a May uniform election as well. Once the cities got done redistricting, the counties were able to redistrict county commissioner districts, school board, and soil and water conservation districts for offices that are elected by district. This had to occur by April 26th. As I mentioned, we did have a special Congressional District 1 primary. So overlapping that primary, which was held on May 24th, we had the candidate filing period for federal, state, county, and offices of cities with a primary that began on May 17th through May 31st. In order to file for offices, candidates must be eligible to vote in Minnesota, have not filed for another office at the upcoming primary or general election, be 21 years of age upon assuming office and have maintained residency in their district for at least 30 days before the general election. For the Congressional Special Election primary, it was to fill the vacant District 1 U.S. Representative seat for the remainder of the term expiring January 3rd that was held by former U.S. Representative Jim Hagedorn. Then on August 9th, we had the state primary election. This was the first election that used the redistrict precincts and districts. The late candidate filing period for offices of cities without the primary 
and towns with November elections and school districts without a primary was held August 2nd through the 16th. Again, that overlapped the state primary election. Popping back to redistricting for just a second, redistricting is the process of redrawing the boundaries of election districts to ensure that people of each district are equally represented after a census. So first, the congressional and legislative districts were redistricted. Congressional districts are 435 seats in the House of Representatives that get divided among the 50 states. Since 1963, Minnesota had eight congressional districts. During redistricting, Brown County was divided into two districts, District 1 and District 7. As you can see, that is outlined by the gold border. Minnesota State Senate is composed of six member, 67 members, and the State House of Representatives is composed of 134 members, with two House districts being fully contained in each Senate district. Brown County switched from State Senate District 16 to 15, and the State Representative District switched from 16B to 15B after redistricting. Then the city councils, um, New Ulm was the only city that needed to redistrict due to new population uh, and shift in the population within their wards and precincts, which then affected Brown County. And so we had to adjust our districts. In response, we realigned commissioner districts one through three to match the New Ulm 2022 precinct boundaries. Milford then changed from Brown County Commissioner District two to Commissioner District four, and Stark Township changed from Brown County Commissioner District four to Commissioner District five. So let's talk about some of the 2022 state general election dates. Uokava dates, or Uokavas on file. Okay. <laughs> on September 23rd, we mailed Uokava ballots to those that we had on file. Uokava stands for the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act. Then, early voting began September 23rd, and that will run through November 7th. Mail ballots were then mailed to registered voters in mail ballot precincts on September 27th. That brings us to next week, where it will be the last day to pre-register to vote. Healthcare facility voting will begin on October 19th and will go through the 7th of November. Direct balloting will begin on November 1st and run until November 7th. And of course, election day is November 8th. So just a couple other dates. Um, September 9th, we sent state general absentee ballot applications to those list of eligible voters who have applied for automatic absentee ballot applications. And then on October 25th, we will do a subsequent mailing of ballots to our mail ballot precincts, anybody who had registered to vote prior to the 20th, but was not registered to vote prior to September 27th when we pulled our file. And finally, I wanna mention that our um, October 27th will be our public accuracy testing, which is open to the public. So registering to vote, a person is eligible to vote if he or she can meet the following criteria. They need to be a US citizen, at least 18 years of age on election day, have resided in Minnesota for 20 days immediately preceding election day, have any felony conviction records discharged, expired, or completed, not be under any court ordered guardianship where the court has revoked voting rights, 
and not have been ruled legally incompetent by a court of law. So 17 year olds can pre-register. However, there are frequently special elections that can be called at any time. So you may find that your application may be returned if that election becomes scheduled between the date you register and your birthday. If that happens, you just simply wait until the election passes and register again. So there are a few instances um, where you need to determine a voter's residence when considering registration. For example, if somebody has multiple houses, a person can only have one residence. They need to decide which is their principal residence. They should consider factors such as where they sleep most nights and where their family resides. Sometimes their home may be damaged due to a disaster. In that case, if a voter intends to return to the home after it is rebuilt or repaired, they do not need to lose residence at that location. But if they do not intend to return home, then they would need to register at their new address. A business address cannot be used unless that is also their home. Neither a U.S. Postal Office box nor its commercial equivalent may be used as a residential address. And then student residence is also an exception. Students may choose to vote either at home or in the precinct where they live while attending school, depending on which they are considering their residence. So in order to register, you can go online. Um, the Secretary of State has a short URL. It's www.mnvotes.org that will take you to be able to register and apply for absentee ballots. You can also register by paper by downloading an application or calling the Brown County office or visiting us on the second floor of the courthouse at 14 South State Street. You may also register to vote when you apply or renew your Minnesota driver's license or state identification card. Registration will temporarily close 20 days before the election and opens again on election day for voters to register at their polling place. So this year, the last date to pre-register for the state general election will be Tuesday, October 18th, and our county office will be open until 5 p.m. Those submitting online voter registrations on the 18th may do so until 11.59 p.m. Therefore, it may take the county a couple of days to finish processing those due to security checks. In Minnesota, you are allowed to register to vote on election day. Any of our following proof of residence options to register at your polling place will be accepted. The first option is an ID with current name and address. You would just need to present a driver's license, learner permit, identification card, or receipt for any of these, or a tribal ID card that has your name, signature, photo, and address. Option two, which is also known as category two, the following are category two. You can use an ID that is expired and a document which may be shown electronically on a device such as a smartphone to prove your address. So we like to refer to this as face in place. So accepted photo IDs include your driver's license, passport, military ID, tribal ID card, or a Minnesota University College or Technical College ID card or a Minnesota high school ID card. Acceptable documents for proof of address would include a lease or rental agreement, which must be valid through election day, your current student fee statement, a bill, account, or start of service statement due or dated within 30 days of the election, such as a phone, internet service, solid waste, sewer, electric service, gas, water, banking or credit cards, and rent or mortgage payments. A category two, continuing with category two options, we have option three, that's to register a voter who can confirm your name and address. Using a registered voter, 
from your precinct, they can go with you to the polling place and sign an oath confirming your address. A registered voter can vouch for up to eight others. Option four, college student ID. For precincts which, which have college housing in them, the college has the option of providing the polling place with a list of students who live in said housing. This list, allow, this list allows college students to register in the polling place simply by providing their student ID that can be used to match to one, the list provided by the college. Option five would be valid registration in the same precinct. If you were previously registered in the same precinct but changed your name, moved within the same precinct, you only need to tell the election official your previous name and address. Option six, notice of late registration. If you pre-register within the 20-day window, the county election office will attempt to process their application and send you a notice of late registration postcard or letter. If a voter receives this in time, you may bring this to serve as your proof of residence. Then you will not need to register again because that document will serve as the necessary proof of residency. And the final option seven is staff person or a residential facility. So if you live in a residential facility, a facility staff person can go with you to the polling place to confirm your address. Brown County's polling locations are listed here. And down below, we show the mail ballot precincts. They include the city of Cobden, Evan and Hanska, and townships of Elbin Cottonwood Home, Lake Hanska, Linden Mulligan, Prairieville, Siegel Stark, and Stately. Most polling locations are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., but some of the township precincts are open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. We will also have extended hours on Saturday, November 5th from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. And we will stay open on November 7th until 5 p.m. for voting. If you need to find your poll, the precinct finder is similar to a zip code directory. Voters must vote in the precinct where they currently live. Precinct boundaries may run down the middle of streets, neighborhoods, neighbors living across the street may be in different precincts. So the polling place finder URL will be posted inside of the greeter judge list if you are at a polling place and you are uncertain, or you can go online to pollfinder.sos.state.mn.us. There's a few simple steps. Step one, you enter your zip code and you click go. Step two is to enter your house number, select your street and click go. And this will bring up your poll finder. And on this, it, you will be able to find what districts you belong in, when the next election is, where you're voting, your precinct name, and also you will be able to find a sample ballot, a list of candidates, many of who have a link to their website to find out more about their um, views and stuff. And Brown County does not have a ballot drop box location, but um, if we were, that is listed. The Secretary of State requires all ballot box locations to be listed. Here is a list of the consolidated offices that will be on the Brown County ballots. Locally, there will be a county commissioner race for districts two, four, and five, the county recorder, county sheriff, county attorney, and then a soil and water conservation district supervisor for district three and five, and a special election for term ending January 6, 2025 for district two. In New Ulm, there is a mayor, one council member for ward two and one council member for ward four on the ballot. 
um, in school district 88 there's three school board members and a question renewal of expiring school district referendum revenue authorization that will also be on the ballot so let's talk voting absentee any eligible voter can vote early in person or by mail the official name for this is voting by absentee ballot voters who wish to vote early must request an absentee ballot by completing an absentee ballot application online or they may vote early in person absentee ballot application and information can be found on the secretary of state's website at mnvotes.org for paper applications or assistance you may call our office at 233-6613 absentee ballot packets can be tracked from the point the voter submits the request an application to the point it is accepted by the county. Ballots may be returned by mail using a prepaid postage envelope that is included when the ballots were mailed. You can deliver it in person at the county courthouse or deliver by designated agent. I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. For in-person per, in voting, it, it, you can come to the courthouse, like I said, during normal business hours from 8 to 4.30, Saturday before the election from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., and the Monday before the election until 5 p.m. So that would be October 7th. Um, we are located on the second floor of the courthouse in addition the last seven days prior to the election there is direct balloting which is like voting absentee however you are able to put your ballot directly into the tabulator if you are a mail ballot precinct and wanting to vote direct balloting we will need to spoil your mail ballot you'll need to apply for absentee voting and then you would vote absentee and then you'd be able to directly put your ballot into the tabulator the final option for voters in the military and citizens outside the u.s there is a process for that the military and overseas voter service provided by the minnesota secretary of state is a great resource that will guide you through the process of receiving your absentee ballot after your absentee ballot is received at the elections office, it's reviewed by absentee ballot board. This board checks for the signature envelope that it was filled out correctly. Each envelope is reviewed by at least two members of the board. Absentee ballots are then set aside in a secure area until seven days prior to the election where they are separated by precinct. We then take the security envelopes open them and the ballot envelopes are removed and set aside so no one knows whose ballot is whose. Once the ballot envelopes are separated, they're open, reviewed by election judges, duplicated if necessary, and inserted in the ballot counter. Example where judges would need to duplicate a ballot include if a ballot was damaged, unreadable by the tabulator, or if a voter marked an error and by doing so, you put a line through your vote and then you put your new vote so we know what the intent is. You can then track your ballot using the ballot tracker at this website. Again, minnesotavotes.org will take you to tracking this. Here's an example of what the status of my absentee or mail ballot tracker looks like. So the track your ballot tool does work for most mail ballot precincts. As long as the ID number with their voter registration record was on there. So if they did not have an ID number within their voter registration record, they won't be able to see their AB ballot record. In that case, you would just need to contact the county and we have tools to look up the status for you. Some of the cities and towns that vote by mail um, are in Brown County are the city of Cobden, Evan and Hanska, 
and the townships, townships of Elbin, Cottonwood, Home, Lake Hansville, Linden, Mulligan, Prairieville, Siegel, Stark, and Stately. Some jurisdictions in Minnesota, Minnesota hold elections by mail instead of voting at polling places. Non-metropolitan townships and cities with less than 400 registered voters located outside of the metropolitan area can choose to hold elections by mail resolution. So all of these precincts listed here provided a resolution to go to a mail ballot precinct. So to pause there for just a second and talk about absentee and mail ballot process a little bit more, the one thing that I wanna stress within this process is to make sure that you're reading instructions carefully. So in order to vote, you're going to wanna take your ballot and you're going to want to show your witness that it, it is blank. And then you'll mark your votes in private. Again, make sure you're following the instructions on the ballot. Don't write your name or ID anywhere on the ballot and do not vote for more candidates than allowed. Because if you do, your votes for that office will not count. As I mentioned, if you're correcting a mistake, you can either contact the county election office and we can issue a new ballot or if there is not time, you can draw a line through it, um, completely cross out the name of the candidate you accidentally marked and mark the ballot for the candidate that you prefer. Do not initial your correction. Once you're done voting, you'll seal your ballot in the tan ballot envelope. Again, do not write on this envelope. Then you'll put that ballot envelope into the white signature envelope. If you had a registration form because you were not registered, you would also put that into the envelope, the white signature envelope. Fill out the white signature envelope completely. If there's no label, you'll need to print your name and Minnesota address. You'll need to either put your driver's license number or the last four digits of your social security card. Make sure that you're using the same numbers that you provided on your absentee ballot application. If you don't have either of those numbers, you would check the box. Make sure you're reading and signing the oath that is listed on the white signature envelope. Ask your witness to print their name and Minnesota street address, including the city, and sign their name and address, or, and sign their name. If your witness is an official notary, they must print their title instead of an address and affix their stamp. Then you'll seal that envelope. Make sure you put the signature envelope into the larger white return envelope to protect your private information from view. Seal that envelope and then you can return your ballot by election day. I cannot encourage you enough to return your ballots as soon as possible because of mail. I need to thank our post offices for doing their due diligence to make sure that we receive all the election mail in a timely fashion. Unfortunately, sometimes they do not come in time and we typically do have some that we have to reject the day after the election. Um, absentee ballots, must be received by 3 p.m. on election day in our office. If it's a mail ballot, you may drop that off at our um, office by 8 p.m. Or you may come in up until 8 p.m. to vote in person. You will not be able to vote by putting your ballot into the tabulator on election day. That ends the Monday, the day before on Monday. If you do not follow instructions correctly, we may have to reject your ballot and issue a replacement if there is enough time. Usually if we're within the few days before the election, we'll try and contact you some other way to have you come in. But the most common reasons that ballot get rejected is because the voter's name on the signature 
doesn't match their application name. The voter's address on the signature envelope does not match the applicant's address. The voter did not sign the signature envelope. The numbers provided on the signature envelope do not match the application of the voter record and the signatures were substantially different. A voter registration application was not included in the signature envelope. The voter registration application was not signed. The voter registration application did not include all required information. The witness did not sign the signature envelope. The witness did not provide a Minnesota address, official title, or notary stamp and the witness did not mark proof of residency used by the voter. Frequently, we find that the voter and witness sign on the wrong lines. So please make sure you look at that closely. I do wanna mention that the name that you're signing does not need to match exactly the name on. So if you normally sign, um, you know, with your middle name or you don't sign with your middle name or you have your middle initial, that is not reason for rejection. So in addition to agent delivery, many of the city clerks do reach out to our assisted living facilities to help facilitate the process. In addition to agent delivery, they could vote in person at their polling location or via absentee ballot. So many of our clerks are doing outreach to make sure that these residents are registered and able to apply for absentee ballot if needed. Voters can get help from election judges or any person of their choice except from an agent of their employer or union. Typically, Voters will ask family members or friends. Candidates may now assist voters. In the past, some jurisdictions had a form to keep track of people that were assisting voting because there was a limit to three. However, in 2020, in 2020 Minnesota District Court decision said that that was no longer the case. Voter assistance can assist as many voters in marking their ballots Two election judges or different major political parties may mark or observe a ballot according to voters' direction. Finally, I wanna talk about transparency and public access. Minnesota elections are the envy of the nation due to strong voter turnout, laws that ensure access to the ballot, robust security measures, and the transparency that's an essential part of maintaining trust in the system. All aspects of elections are governed by state and federal laws, and many functions are open or available to the public. Serving as an election judge is the best way to learn about elections, and it's a great way to serve the community. To be an election judge, you must be eligible to vote in Minnesota and able to read, write, and speak English. Relatives cannot serve together in the same precinct at the same time, Relatives of a candidate cannot serve in the precinct where the candidate is on the ballot. Candidates cannot serve in a precinct where they are on the ballot. And students age 16 and 17 can be election judge trainees. A relative is defined as a spouse, parent, step parent, child, stepchild, sibling, or step sibling. Election judges are required to attend two hours of training and you may choose whether to volunteer or be paid. Your employer is required to give you time off from work to be an election judge without a reduction in pay. To qualify, you need to notify your employer in writing at least 20 days in advance and attach your copy and pay rate from your written notice. The schedule and pay rate will be provided by the jurisdiction that hires you to be an election judge. So what a without reduction in pay means is you will get to earn at least the same amount you would have if you went to work that day. So in practice, if your, you, your employer can ask you to turn over the amount you earn as an election judge during the hours because you would have normally made more money and they'll deduct that amount from your normal pay. 
Again, you can also take voluntary vacation to be paid for your full day of work and then you would also be able to make the extra income as an election judge. So one of our processes for transparency is public accuracy testing. Before every election, local election officials test all equipment to be used in that election. For the preliminary testing, ballots are marked with assistive voting devices. Currently, we're using the Omni ballot tablets. A set of pre-marked ballots is fed into the ballot tabulators, and the machine totals are compared with predetermined results. Then at the public accuracy tested, which gets conducted within 14 days prior to the election, some of the tabulators and assisted voting devices are tested again. Brown County's public accuracy testing for the November 18th, sorry, the November 8th state general election will be conducted on Thursday, October 27th at 10 a.m. in the Brown County Law Enforcement Training Room located at 15 South Washington Street in New Ulm. We will publish notice at least two days before testing and the public accuracy test is open to the public. Then on election night, county election officials enter unofficial election results on the Secretary of State's website. Following election day, the county election officials will audit and proof their work. It may be necessary to make corrections of small errors or typos. Certain summary statistics, safe at home, and presidential and federal only UOCAVA ballots casted have to be manually entered, so a transposition error or something may occur from time to time. In the event that there's a discrepancy, such as a wrong ballot style being issued to a voter, there are statutes and processes for us to follow to rectify the situation, which in the end may create a difference between unofficial and official numbers. Election judges are required to attend training in an effort to be knowledgeable and prevent any mistake from having an impact on the outcome on an office in a close race. Following the period of review, the county canvases. This needs to be held between November 11th and the 18th, between the third and 10th day following the state general election. Once results are approved by election officials, the county canvassing board meets to review and approve the results before they become official. They'll also certify that the votes cast within the county for races that go beyond the county boundaries and certifies the election results for offices up for election that were voted upon exclusively within the county. So those county offices and legislative districts that aren't entirely contained within the county will not will be conducted with the state canvassing board. Those that are entirely contained within the county will be canvassed by the county canvassing board. Each municipality and school district has their own canvassing board to certify the results in those races. Upon the completion of the canvassing, the board promptly prepares and files a report with the county auditor, which includes the number of individuals voting at the election in each precinct, the number of individuals registered before election day, and the number of individuals registering to vote on election day in the precinct, and then the names of the candidates for each office and the number of votes received by each candidate in each precinct. The board will also declare the candidate duly elected who received the highest number of votes for each county and state office voted only within the county. The county auditor will certify and send the abstract to the office of the Secretary of State where they'll review it and incorporate it into the statewide canvas that is presented to the state canvassing board. Then November 29th, the state canvassing board will meet. It's similar to the county canvassing where they will meet and review the state primary and general election results. Um, for a primary, they meet seven days following the primary or on the third Tuesday following a state general election. 
So that's why it'll be November 29th for the state general election. The responsibilities include canvassing and certifying the results of all statewide elections, including the state and federal offices, state constitutional amendment ballot questions, and state and legislative and judicial offices that overlap more than one county. Upon the request of an apparent losing candidate, the state canvassing board would oversee those recounts of the results for that office. State canvassing boards also consists of five members. The secretary of state serves as the chair and the secretary appoints two members of the state Supreme Court and two judges from a district. The canvassing for certified copies of the county canvassing board reports received from the county auditors and prepared a report that states the number of individuals voting in the state and in each county, the number of votes received by each of the candidates, specifying the counties in which they were cast, and the number of votes counted for and against each constitutional amendment, specifying the counties in which they were cast. All members of the state canvassing board sign the report and certify its correctness. The state canvassing board declares the results within three days after completing the canvas. The final step is the post-election review. This is held on a date between November 9th and the 19th and the 26th. So Minnesota statute states that after every state general election, Minnesota counties perform a post-election review of election results returned by the optical scan ballot or tabulator used in the state. This is a hand count of ballots for each alleged. This is a hand count of the ballots for each eligible election for U.S. President, U.S. Senate. This is a hand count of the ballots for each eligible election including U.S. President, U.S. Senator, U.S. Representative, and Governor in the selected precincts and compared with the results from the voting system used in their precincts. For 2022, the post-election review is mandated, mandated for the U.S. Representative and Minnesota Governor. Brown County's post-election review was set for Monday, November 21st, at 9 a.m. in the Brown County Law Enforcement Training Room in the basement level at 15 South Washington Street. At the canvas of the state general election, the county canvassing board will randomly select the precincts that will be reviewed. In a county with fewer than 50,000 registered voters, the canvassing board must conduct a post-election review of a total of at least two precincts with one of those precincts having more than 150 votes cast. The Secretary of State must review and evaluate election procedures in the precincts audited in the post-election review. This is called the post-election performance review. At least four precincts in each congressional district will be reviewed. Precincts are chosen by lot by the state canvassing board at its meeting to canvass the general election. I hope you found this process informative. And if you have any questions, I encourage you to call our office at 507-233-6613. Or you can go online to Brown County's website at www.co.brown dot mn dot us along our banner at the top of our website there should be a quick link to elections i thank you for your time and i hope you have a great election